Uh, we would like to start now. Uh, I think there are a few uh, panelists who, uh, one, one panelist who, with, uh, who, who's missing, but I'm sure he, uh, he will join us um, very soon. Um, welcome to this panel discussion on mental well-being and development. My name is Akiko Ito. I am Chief of the Secretariat for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, of the Division for Social Policy and Development uh, in Endesa, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Um, I am very pleased to, uh, to present to you this panel. We have a list of such distinguished panels this afternoon um, from, from all over the world. I am also uh, very pleased to say that, that um, this panel discussion has, uh, has this contribution from, from the expert group meeting on the same theme, um, panel discussion on mental, uh, expert group meeting on mental well-being and disability, uh, but with a focus on disaster risk reduction that took place in Tokyo uh, just last week, 26th and 27th of November. Uh, so this uh, panel discussion uh, is, has, it, it will be able to uh, to, uh, to have uh, at its table this rich contribution of another expert group meeting, uh, which is on this important issue of including mental well-being and mental health in society and development. And I would just, by way of introduction, I would like to mention that this uh, panel discussion is, in, is, a, is, is actually is taking place um, as part of uh, our efforts during the past several years to, uh, to actually to promote inclusion of mental health and mental well-being in all aspects of the work we do for inclusive society and inclusive development. Uh, we started uh, this important um, uh, issue uh, with uh, WHO, we have World Health Organization, uh, as well as um, United Nations um, UNFPA, um, and we also worked closely with World Bank, United Nations University, uh, International Institute for Global Health in, in Malaysia, to, uh, to bring together uh, different um, sets of experts uh, in this field for the past several years. We have, a, we have actually detailed information on UN.enable, so I hope you'll be able to, uh, to, to, to visit this website to get more detailed information. Um, just to give you one example, uh, we had an expert group meeting in, in, in Japan after, war, uh, after the tsunami, earth, uh, great uh, Tohoku earthquake in, in Japan in 2011. And we, we actually had very specific reference to, uh, to the issue of uh, inclusion of those with developmental disabilities um, and, uh, in, in the context of disaster risk reduction. And uh, there are a number of uh, um, examples of how disability is not a burden. Disability is a resource uh, in this context. How uh, leaders uh, in a community working together with people with disabilities, they were able to save many, many lives on the ground. So this is one of the examples that, that uh, we wanted to, to bring to, the, to this panel discussion uh, of how inclusion uh, can advance inclusive society and saves lives, you know, in, in the case of disaster risk reduction. Uh, so without further ado, um, I would like to, uh, to introduce um, to this, uh, this morning uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of Argentina, um, who is a uh, co-organizer co of this important panel discussion, and I'd like to uh, invite him to give his remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Akiko. And I, I would like to express on behalf of the Mission of Argentina that it is uh, a real pleasure for us to, to be part of this activity uh, together with the permanent mission of Bangladesh. So uh, it's also um, an honor to be among uh, so distinguished experts uh, to discuss this, uh, this uh, issue that is uh, very important uh, in light of the discussions that we are going to have uh, in the forthcoming months uh, in, in the, on the post-2015 development agenda. Uh, and um, I would like also to, to thank the World Bank and the United Nations University for co-organizing this, uh, this uh, event. 
Um, I, I entirely agree with you when, when you said that uh, these discussions, all the discussions are going to take place during the, 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 this, uh, this uh, day are, are, going to, are, are very, very relevant and very important for, for, for all of us in, 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 the, in the deliberations that we, we have here at the United Nations. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, unfortunately, an expert on, on mental health, uh, uh, and uh, so I will offer uh, some uh, brief remarks on, on our experience here at the United Nations on uh, trying to deal with this issue and trying to uh, mainstream questions relating to mental health and well-being, uh, in particular with regard to disabilities. And also, um, I would uh, offer some uh, very brief uh, comments on uh, the approach that we have in my country, in, in Argentina, I believe that uh, we are going to have also the opportunity to hear uh, from uh, our uh, uh, Bangladeshi uh, colleagues on, on the experience uh, that they have in a very different part of our world. And uh, I believe that um, this is also a demonstration uh, uh, of the importance that we attach uh, in, in, in many developing countries to address this issue in an, in an holistic way and uh, with uh, a, a human rights-based approach. So um, I, I believe the starting point for our discussions today is, um, uh, as, as you mentioned, and it's, it's also mentioned in the, in the concept paper that we have um, uh, for this event, is um, the relationship among uh, mental health, mental well-being, disability, and development, and and and, and the need to strike the right balance in, uh, in uh, among these uh, three dimensions, uh, in particular with regard to the post-2015 development agenda. This is going to be probably our, our focus uh, in, in 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 the negotiations are going to have, hopefully, uh, for next year. Uh, in the MDGs, as we all know, uh, the lack of focus on vulnerable persons and, and most marginalized uh, resulted in their relative neglect. And um, uh, that's why for, for Argentina and for other countries, uh, I believe that's the same case uh, with, uh, with Bangladesh, the central principle for the, this uh, post-2015 development agenda is uh, that we uh, should not uh, leave anyone behind. Uh, and uh, that equity should also be uh, a major parameter in, in terms of uh, success uh, in, in when we are going to implement the, uh, the post-2015 development agenda. Um, so even if, I mean, economic and social development are, are a priority to, to, for all of us, uh, but uh, our, our policies should be based on promoting an inclusive path to development. And this a, a question regarding inclusion is, is, is quite basic uh, when we devise and when we prepare and we draft our, our laws and our policies regarding, uh, in particular, mental health, disability and, and social inclusion. Um, as, as I mentioned before, uh, for us, uh, this post 2015 development agenda is a rights-based agenda. And uh, that's why we, we do believe that uh, the human rights uh, of everyone, in particular the vulnerable groups, uh, should be, should be uh, fully taken to, into account. Um, but unfortunately, so far, the, the link between mental well-being and disability with development uh, has been, in, in my opinion, neglected by, by, by the work and the discourses that we had at the United Nations. So it's high time for us to address this issue. Um, uh, as it is increasingly recognized, uh, health is an essential component of the overall sustainable development. Uh, and but, and it, it is also clear that mental health is essential for human development and that improves the population mental well-being is an outcome of such a development. Uh, so uh, consideration of mental health uh, advances the objectives of equity, universal coverage, well-being, and uh, as I mentioned before, a holistic and life course approach to health and human rights. Um, 
so this is, um, let's say, the general approach that we have regarding this, this issue. How we did, uh, uh, how we tried to manage uh, to, to, to translate this into, into a national legislation and national approaches is basically uh, through um, revamping of our, um, uh, our policies regarding uh, mental health uh, and the mental health system. Uh, in 2010, in my country, in Argentina, we, um, the, a, a new bill on, on mental health uh, and human rights uh, was passed. And this uh, bill uh, is, uh, I would say, the cornerstone of the policies that, that we have um, in, in this regard currently. And, and this bill is very much based on uh, inter alia, the International Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. This is uh, one of the, of, the, of the pillars of this, uh, of this law. And uh, we decided to give this bill, this uh, law, uh, um, uh, this, uh, sorry, this convention, uh, the uh, a constitutional hierarchy in, in, our, uh, in our system. So it's uh, very much... Uh, uh, at the forefront of our, 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 our concerns, um, at, in particular to, to, to strike the right balance, uh, as I said before. Um, uh, one of the issues is that uh, we had to um, uh, get rid of uh, an approach that was uh, an approach where uh, interning people in institutions so was... Uh, um, uh, was considered to be the, 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 the right, uh, the right uh, uh, um, approach, the right, well, the, the, the right uh, uh, way of dealing with this, uh, this uh, with um, mental health and, 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 and disabilities. But uh, in, in, in the inter-American system, we decided uh, through recommendations of the Pan-American uh, Health Organization that uh, by 2020, we should get rid of mental hospitals in, in the whole region. Uh, in, my, in, in my country, we are, we are doing that. Uh, we are doing that uh, progress uh, in, in mainstreaming in general hospitals, for example, the, the, in, the, 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 the questions regarding the, um, uh, dealing with um, mental health internments. And, um, and that's why in, in the last year, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, this uh, internments uh, grew by uh, 88%. Uh, and also uh, we um, increase uh, the community-based programs uh, regarding these, these, these issues. Um, and, and, and also what uh, is important is that um, when we change paradigms, uh, and this is about the change of paradigms in, 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 in terms of what we are going to, uh, to do in, in, in my country, and I hope in, in, in different countries, and maybe we are going to have the possibility of hearing other people's experience on, in, in this regard, uh, we have to um, make sure that uh, um, uh, there are inter interdisciplinary um, um, uh, interaction by all actors, uh, including at the, at the local level, in order to make these policies uh, consistent throughout uh, our, our, our health system, including uh, at the local and at the, at, the, at the state level and also at the national level. Uh, and in, my, in, in, the case, in the case of my country, we, we established uh, a, a national interministerial commission on mental health and addiction and uh, to articulate actions and policies in this regard. And uh, I believe this is uh, also a way of including uh, all um, areas regarding this uh, that has a, have uh, some kind of competence on these questions in order to uh, make this holistic approach a success. Um, I believe that um, if we are uh, to achieve this uh, paradigm shift uh, in, in, in mental health, uh, we uh, have to include people with uh, disabilities and, 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 and in particular with psychological and, and mental disabilities 
uh, and uh, we have to bring them back to the community. And, and this is all the, the, the uh, I believe, the, the reason that uh, why we do believe that uh, inclusion is, is the best way to approach these questions. Inclusion is not only a question of um, a health system, but it's also a question regarding education, educational system. And uh, this is also a, an area in which we face many problems and, and, and many challenges. And I wouldn't say that we solve all these problems uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, confidence I, and, 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 at, and at the same level in all, in all our countries. Um, I, I would uh, end by um, uh, making um, a, a, a very personal comment on, on my experience uh, being a father of uh, 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 one, uh, one of my, my, actually my son, he has uh, autism. He has been diagnosed as, uh, with a PDD, pervasive development disorder. Um, he's 11 years old, and um, uh, when we uh, had to um, uh, bring him to the uh, educational system, both in Argentina and in the United States, uh, we face uh, so many obstacles, um, and really it's not exactly um, that um, if the right policies are in place, you are going to be successful in terms of uh, uh, bringing um, um, people with disabilities uh, and, 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 and helping them to achieve their real potential, all their, their potential. Uh, Developing countries are, have many difficulties in this regard, and I, I experienced these difficulties myself. But also developed countries have uh, the same kind of problems and, and, and face the same, uh, the same uh, challenges. Um, I hope that uh, after, um, when we had the, the, the interactive uh, discussion here, we are going to be able to uh, make uh, um, or to address more in depth uh, the, the, the challenges that remain ahead. And, and I, I'm very interested in hearing the experience of Bangladesh in this regard, in particular with regard to autism, for example. But um, to conclude, I believe that we have to uh, really uh, make a difference uh, when we negotiate in the next phases of negotiations in the post-2015 development agenda. Mental health is one issue that uh, should be there in, in a prominent way. We have to um, uh, bring uh, into, into effect and, and translate into, into policies and into concrete action this uh, shift of the paradigm that we had in terms of uh, how to tackle uh, questions regarding to mental health and, and disabilities. Uh, I, I very much... Uh, uh, welcome the, 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 uh, what, um, the, the, the work that has been done by the, uh, by the committee uh, on, 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 on the rights of persons with disability in this regard. And I encourage uh, the United Nations and, and ourselves to work together in order to uh, make this a reality when we uh, have to uh, put in paper next year uh, some of precise commitments on how to deal with these, these issues. So uh, thank you very much, Akiko, and uh, thank you for this opportunity for Argentina to participate in this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for, your, uh, for your remarks. Um, indeed, the General Assembly has been reiterating the importance of including uh, people with persons of disabilities with mental and, and intellectual disabilities uh, in, in the context of its work. Uh, high level, uh, General Assembly High Level Meeting on Disability Development also emphasized the importance of uh, including those invisible uh, population and their perspectives, including those with mental, um, um, mental disabilities and intellectual disabilities. So thank you very much. Now I would like to turn to, uh, to another uh, co-sponsor, uh, Permanent Mission of Bangladesh. And I understand that uh, Permanent Mission of Bangladesh is represented by, uh, by the expert, uh, Ms. Saina Wazit Hossein. 
and she is uh, she was appointed in June as an expert advice advisor uh, by WHO, and she's also chairperson of National Advisory Committee on Autism in Bangladesh, and led campaign uh, for uh, in her country to, for pass, uh, passage of resolution uh, concerning autism in the World Health Assembly. Thank you, uh, Madam Akiko, for introducing me and uh, for giving me this opportunity to share the uh, uh, story of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, mental health, uh, being a mental health uh, professional, this is something extremely close to my heart. I've, I'm very p passionate about it and uh, worked uh, towards it. But I'm passionate about it not only because of uh, being a professional in this area, but this is a very personal story for me. In uh, 2000, my 46-year-old uh, uh, mother-in-law uh, uh, became within a year extremely clinically depressed and uh, committed suicide, dis despite all of the uh, resources that may have been uh, available to her, but they were not available for her in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, coming, uh, you know, living in a family with uh, very highly educated and having all of the financial resources was still services were not accessible to her. And uh, so, you know, uh, to me, um, the vision is to uh, create a better understanding of me what mental health is. It's not just absence of a mental health disease, but uh, to help persons ha have better coping skills, uh, have more resilience, and also have the support when they need it. Because I believe that you know, all of us at any point in time can go through certain experiences in life that can lead to a mental health condition without the right support. So just to, uh, so addressing mental health in low resource settings um, in uh, countries like Bangladesh, I'd like to kind of give a little overview of what many developing countries and low resource countries are faced with and some of the specific challenges of uh, Bangladesh. And then uh, I'll go over a little bit of the model that we've developed in, uh, in Bangladesh with specifically addressing um, autism spectrum disorders. But uh, I want to clarify that although we kind of start with autism spectrum disorders, the, the ripple effects of that and, and the all-encompassing uh, change that has, uh, it's positively affected all the disabilities. So, uh, the, you know, uh, when you talk about, um, you know, mental health disorders, the primary thing that we usually think about is certainly stigma. But in low resource countries, a lack of skilled professionals and infrastructure. And infrastructure, not just meaning uh, ha not having the hospitals, but infrastructure as far as not having the right kind of policies, not having um, services available within uh, the community and accessible to the person. This is 2005 global mapping of uh, services for all disabilities, and you can, as you can see, Southeast Asia has uh, the least amount in uh, compared to any other part of the world. So it's a very significant uh, challenge for us. So specifically to uh, Bangladesh, uh, you know, uh, we still uh, the only mental health act that we have right now is the 1912 Lunacy Act uh, by the British and the. F only once for a population of 156 million, we have only one psychiatric hospital that was built in 1957. Uh, we have a national institute uh, that was started in 1981. And so uh, although we have a Neurodevelopmental Disability Trust Act, although we have uh, an act for uh, overall disability that's just currently been passed, mental health is not as well addressed as it possibly could be. So, uh, you know, uh, since uh, 1981, we have a well-defined uh, chain of referral system. But as you can see, uh, that you know, within district hospitals that we can have that you know psychiatrists can provide. But as this uh, you know graph kind of shows, it ends up being the, in the district hospital. There's only one district out of the seven that has actually a psychiatrist. So. We have a significant challenge of all psychiatric patients needing to come to Dhaka and uh, receiving services at the one hospital that we have. Prevalence, so uh, there have been several uh, studies that has been done uh, in 2003 and in 2009. Uh, the last study in 2003 to 2005, a national survey was done. So 16.1% adults have um, a mental health condition in uh, Bangladesh. 
2009, a survey was done to look at children and uh, separating, you know, epilepsy and um, substance abuse and intellectual disabilities, just mental health disorders was 18.4% of the population of children. So, um, you know, like I said, 156 uh, million population, so we've got 210 psychiatrists, and uh, you know, not a lot of uh, support for a family. And uh, looking at the overall budget on mental health, it used to be, um, 2007 data kind of shows 0.44% of the overall health budget. And unpublished uh, data they've been willing to share with me, it hasn't even come out yet, is now reduced to 0.25% of the total health budget. So uh, not, not a lot of, uh, not a good sign, and I hope this conversations and conferences like this will change uh, that. So uh, in 2011, we launched a massive campaign focusing on neurodevelopmental disorders and autism. And uh, through that awareness and creating, a, uh, you know, exploring or sort of developing a uh, white paper, a situation analysis of what has uh, going on in the country, we developed a multi-sectoral model where we started off with identifying eight ministries that in one way or the other were involved uh, with uh, children with uh, autism spectrum disorders. So in, you know, uh, in Bangladesh, the situation was anything with disability was with the uh, purview of the Ministry of Social Welfare. And so uh, health matters, um, uh, matters related to education, matters related to um, um, uh, in you know buildings rural, rural development is concerned women and child affairs they w did not really have any allocation of funds they did not have any policies they really did not include it in their mandate so we developed this multi ministry uh, model and we also involved which was hitherto uh, not done were a lot of the NGOs and a few uh, organizations. A lot of them are parent-run organizations, and we brought them into the uh, conversation and formulated a national advisory committee, a national steering committee, and a technical guidance committee so that has all the stakeholders kind of sitting together, identifying where are the gaps, identifying what kind of policies, what kind of programs and support, what can each uh, ministry do. And so now we're at, uh, because of the success, because having a dis the discussion and really identifying um, you know, what role do they play? Uh, what could be their part in an interaction with persons with uh, disabilities and particularly, you know, uh, those with autism spectrum disorders? Each ministry developed their own um, uh, individual uh, action plan. And we are very fortunate that a uh, person from the Ministry of Finance who was very personally engaged in this was always a part of that conversation because at the end of the day, what the government will do, which each ministry will do is has to be approved by the Ministry of Finance and so having them kind of be a part of it from day one was uh, very positive. So th this is the um, model for increasing for capacity for all dis uh, disability services. We've been, uh, the first stage has been doing sensitization training and this sensitization training started even with the ministries when we developed the steering committee we had over uh, the you know, four month period that they developed an action plan. They received uh, uh, sensitization training, understanding not just what autism spectrum disorders are, but understanding what all disabilities are, what kind of challenges are faced, what are the inadequacies in, in the system. And so that uh, is an ongoing uh, uh, process. We have been doing that for the last three years. And this first stage of training has, then has been followed up with specialized training, dis helping individuals and um, distinguish between the different uh, disabilities. And certainly the third uh, stage is training of the experts, because even with our health professionals, even with many of our psychologists, when it comes to uh, you know uh, autism spectrum disorders, they are not as uh, well informed as we need them to be. So uh, achievements in the disability issues for uh, Bangladesh, uh, in 2010 we had the, for the first time a center uh, for neurodevelopment and autism. 
And most recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, we learned that that's uh, become a, a full-fledged institution now. So that's going to really help with not just doing research, but actually doing professionalized training. Uh, in 2011, like I said, we had the conference, and this was the first time that anywhere in the world, I mean, and for Southeast Asia, this was a huge conference of um, you know, more than a thousand professionals talking about a specific disability, but a declaration was signed. And this mm, uh, boosted not just the fact that it brought uh, issue of disability to the forefront, but it was a huge um, boost for parents and families because, like I said in the first slide, the stigma that is associated with uh, disability in general, and particularly um, uh, disorders such as uh, autism, parents did not acknowledge, families did not acknowledge, and so this kind of destigmatized it and uh, sort of brought everybody to the table and brought it out in the open. Um, in 2012, we had the, conducted the situation analysis, and in 2013 has been, of course, along with our two different policies, we've got, uh, we conducted a, a national survey where we screened almost 8,000 children from birth to nine years using a community health system. Um, I, I wish I could say that the data was very significant, but what it showed us in this pilot study is that community health workers are well equipped to be trained to do these kind of screening. Um, we may need a bit more uh, uh, training because we're looking at uh, how we're defining autism and how what they understand about about autism spectrum disorder, um, but the the data, the uh, 0 0.08 versus the 2.46, the spread out of the data is uh, difference between urban and rural, and then we really, that's something that we need to explore, the why is it so much lower in the rural setting? Um, uh, and of course, uh, we've done a national disability survey, am I running over time? <laughs> Sorry. Um, achievements in, in, in mental health, of course, we've had a lot of uh, uh, awareness. We've developed a lot of manual. Uh, one of the things specifically for a psychiatrist is in the absence of having um, specific, specific service providers there constantly, we have weekly voluntary uh, psychiatric services being provided. And uh, they've also been doing um, training for the uh, health professionals. And it's just been um, like seven days to about two week long um, uh, training for doctors. So uh, achievements in disability policy, uh, the Neurodevelopmental Disability Protection Trust Act uh, was just signed in 2013. And we've uh, updated this Disability Rights and Protection Act to be more in line with the CRPD. So priority needs uh, for uh, Bangladesh is uh, uh, adoption of a mental health policy within our existing services and structures. In a lot of ways, emulating our the multi uh, sectoral planning and our um, steering committee, multi minister steering committee, using that for a mental health. Not, um, Unfortunately, you know, there's always been this di dichotomy between um, policies and programs for persons with abilities and persons with disabilities, and I think that's where we have to kind of uh, change it. Uh, you can't, um, uh, you know, separate one uh, from the other, but something that's all-encompassing and uh, inclusive. And incorporation of mental health uh, within the national health policies and programs and standardizing the training and regulating mental health professions. Unfortunately, in Bangladesh, psychiatrists are the only ones who, because they go through medical training, that they are registered. Mental health psychologists, uh, there's no standardized training for them, um, academic or uh, experiential. There is no way of monitoring, and there is no ongoing training, uh, which means that the mental health field has changed so much and how we conceptualize it, what kind of treatments we are um, uh, formulating now. And uh, without that ongoing training, uh, mental health professionals can access that. And of course, uh, organizing multidisciplinary team within community uh, community-based uh, centers, uh, community health centers, as well as um, social uh, centers that are run by the Ministry of Social Welfare. So this is our, the only hospital, as you can see, it's not very large. Uh, and I'd like to uh, end with that vision in mind that for a population of 156 uh, million and 16.1% of whom suffer some kind of mental health disorder, we have just that one hospital. And I'm sure it's not only Bangladesh, many developing countries 
uh, are faced with this kind of challenge. So we need to kind of think about how can we take uh, those suffering with in mental health conditions out of psychiatric centers and find a way to provide them the kind of support, help them build resilience, help them build uh, coping skills, and access uh, evidence-based uh, treatment uh, within the communities that they live in, and not just for them, the entire families. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to uh, express uh, my great, great appreciation to both co-sponsors, um, Permanent Mission of Argentina and Permanent Mission of Bangladesh, um, His Excellency Ambassador Estrem, Estreme and Ms. Hossein. I'd like to turn, uh, turn this over now to, uh, uh, to our co-organizers, the World Bank Tokyo Development Learning Center, um, as, as well as uh, United Nations University um, United Nations, Uni United Nations uh, University International Institute for Global Health. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Takashi Jutsu to introduce uh, the rest of the program and, and panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akiko, um, for your kind introduction and also for your leadership in this area. And also I would like to thank uh, His Excellency Mr. Matteo Estreme and also uh, Ms. Saima Wazed Hussein for your really strong and insightful presentations. Thank you very much. I'm very delighted that we can have this important panel discussion today with all of these you know, global leaders in this area, mental well-being and disability. Um, it's really timely, I think, because it's right after the um, you know, uh, submission of Open Working Group's um, draft SDGs, which includes mental well-being and disability in the current draft. So um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Tsutsumi, Dr. Atsuro Tsutsumi from the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health, UNUIIGH. Um, he has been the key person in the UN to you know, push forward this issue of mental well-being and disability and uh, developing the conceptual framework in the UN. Um, thank you very much for joining, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Akiko and uh, Takashi, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to talk about current, current status of mental health, uh, well, mental well-being, and the disabilities as a new priority of uh, SDGs and beyond. First, I'd like to start with a shocking number. Annual suicide death is about one million. War-related death is about a third of suicide death and murder-related deaths is about half. This means in our world, suicide death is higher than the deaths related to war and murder combined. We have a security, we have a security council and a PKO who are military in countries for war and countries have police and law enforcement system for murder. However, do we have a system for suicide prevention? Uh, this is uh, another comparison of suicide deaths with MDG priorities. Uh, comparing with AIDS, malaria, and maternal mortality, we can see uh, suicide deaths should be also prioritized. And in fact, globally, suicide is the leading cause of the deaths among young girls. Now, I'd like to share some facts related to mental well-being and disability. According to OECD, one out of two people experience mental illness in their lives. And one out of five patients who, visited, who visit primary healthcare settings have a mental disorder. This means health workers on the ground have a huge pressure to uh, treating mental disorders in many cases, without being provided training and system to support or essential drugs. As a result, about 80% of persons with mental disorders in developing, developing countries 
do not receive any appropriate treatment. And these people with severe mental disorders die 20 years earlier than those uh, without such conditions. These persons with mental or intellectual disabil disabilities often face, face a severe human rights violations, such as abuse, sexual violence, forced sterilizations, or even murder. Though persons with mental or intellectual disabilities are often neglected, for, example, uh, for, in for instance, the depression is a leading cause of disabilities, according to the year life with disability statistics. The lastly, the economic uh, impact of uh, not addressing, uh, according to uh, not addressing the issues related to mental health, is uh, quite huge. The dialect and the indirect cost of mental ill health is more than four percent of GDP. Countries in blue do not have mental health policy. So about half of countries do not have mental health policies in the world. The budget allocation for mental health uh, within national health uh, budget tend to be very low. Among low-income countries, less than 1% is allocated for mental health. And even among lower middle income countries and also uh, upper middle income countries, mental health is only about 2% health budget, which is way too small. These figures uh, show the number of psychiatrists. Countries in red have uh, less than one psychiatrist in 100,000 people. 40 countries do not have any psychiatrist. For the issue uh, related to mental health and mental well-being and the disabilities, UN system has made uh, several important efforts in the past. For example, the WHO constitutions which define the health states, the health is a state of the physical, mental, and social well-being. Similarly, the International Covenant on the in Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which is one of the most important human rights tools defined rights to health as a rights to physical and mental health. So when we talk about the rights to health, the right to mental health should be always uh, included. Then the uh, UN General Assembly adopted the Declaration of the Rights of the Mentally Detected uh, Persons in 1971 and the principles for the per, uh, protections, uh, principles of, for the protection of the persons with mental illness, and the improvement of uh, mental health care in 1991, this made a significant step forward in international community. However, at the same time, the, since it has been a long time since they were adopted, some concepts is these are outdated. Then, in 2006, CRPD was adopted, which includes mental and intellectual impairments. In 2007, the key humanitarian response actors got together under the UN OCHA's leadership with the WHO technical guidance. And IASC guidelines on mental health and psychosocial support in emergency settings was published as an outcome of UN uh, energy of collaboration and coordination. In 2010, UN DESA and WHO jointly issued a policy analysis of mental health and, develop and development, which set foundation to include mental well-being and the disability in the development agenda. General Assembly adopted the World Autism Awareness Day in 2007 and the World Down Syndrome Day in 2011, which made a significant, significant contribution to awareness raising. The last year, UN DESA, UNU, and partners facilitated a UN expert group meeting on mental well-being, disability, and development, which recommended to include mental well-being and disability in the post-2015 
post-2015 uh, development framework. In 2013, last year, the UN high-level meeting on disability and development was also held in New York as the head of a state level. And uh, Akiko says, uh, last week, UN DESA, UNU, and the partners they held another uh, expert group meeting on mental well-being, disabilities, and disaster risk reduction. Based on these reports, now the international community is uh, discussing the integration of mental well-being and disabilities in the post-2015 development agenda, as well as the possibility of the UN high-level meeting on mental health. The World Bank Group is planning to hold an international conference on mental health next year. The UN expert group meeting on mental well-being, disability, and development was the first in kind in the UN history. The EGM recommended two key messages. First, importance to integrate mental well-being into all development uh, efforts as a key indicator for sustainable development, especially post-2015 development agenda. But secondly, the expert group meeting, the expert group recommended to strengthen the protection and the promotion of rights of the persons with mental or intellectual disabilities. The expert group meeting on mental well-being and the disability and the disaster risk reduction was held as a process to prepare for the, uh, for the World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction planned in two, uh, 2015 in Sendai, Japan. The expert group, the expert group uh, recommended to the first recognize the mental well-being and the disability as a priority in DRR. The second, to include mental well-being and optimize, uh, to optimize the resilience in Hyogo framework for action two. The third, include mental, mental or intellectual disabi disabilities in all the disability inclusive DRR. The fourth, develop global guidelines on mental well-being and disabilities in DRR. And lastly, uh, to establish a multi-stakeholder focus group on mental well-being and disability in the UN system. In the discussion to develop post-2015 development agenda, there has been emerging, emerging consensus that the post-2015 agenda should include mental well-being and disability. As a result, the proposed target for uh, SDGs by op uh, open, working group, open Working Group includes uh, reduce non-communicable diseases and promote mental health and well-being, as well as strengthen substance abuse prevention and treatment and its draft, as, as Takashi explained. Then, uh, so now, the way forward, uh, men mental health and well-being is currently included in the SDGs, uh, draft S SDGs. We need to ensure it will be included in the final, final SDGs, and we need to start preparing for its uh, implementation. In addition, it is very important to include mental well-being and the disability in other development priorities, too such as Hyogo Framework for Action 2. Now further, it is necessary to take measures not to leave light lights of the persons with mental or intellectual disabilities behind in all the disability-inclusive development efforts. And it would be very useful to develop a multi-stakeholder working group on mental well-being and the disability in the UN system and develop guidelines as well as monitoring mechanism. For that, uh, we need to scale up knowledge sharing regarding successes and the failures to learn from other countries' experiences. There are already solution packages which you can download from websites. I hope we can get together and now start to work, start working on promotion of mental well-being and disabilities as a key priority in sustainable development. Thank you.
The next speaker is uh, Dr. Fan, Dr. Mark Van Omeren from uh, WHO. He's a scientist in the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse in WHO World Health Organization in headquarters. Uh, he, cannot, he could not come to New York, so he prepared a pre-recorded PowerPoint presentation. So could you, thank you. Good day. I'm pleased to share with you WHO perspectives on mental health and psychosocial well-being in emergency settings with an emphasis on disaster risk reduction. I will be focusing mainly on major emergencies. Uh, I think most of us will know what we mean with that. But to be clear, I'm talking about natural disasters, major industrial accidents, conflict. These are situations in which, which people's lives and dignity are threatened. And some form of outside help is usually requested. There are a range of global policies and resources that are relevant. Uh, there's the Sphere Handbook, which provides uh, minimum standards for disaster response. It's globally the most widely used handbook for disaster response. There's Interagency Standing Committee, IAC, guidelines for mental health and psychosocial support. There is the WHO's Mental Health Global Action Plan, which uh, which is endorsed by all member states, WHO, all, all ministries of health of the world have endorsed that, and uh, which is in line with the previously named Sphere and IAC guidelines. And there is the MHCAP program of WHO, which is about integrating mental health in general health care, which is very relevant also in emergencies. Now, uh, emergencies don't happen in a vacuum when you are thinking of preparing for an emergency. We need to think that uh, any community will have people with social problems. Let's think of marginalized groups, unemployment. Uh, any community will have people with psychiatric problems. Uh, so that's the context in which disasters happen. And then emergency will induce new problems, new social problems, um, and often new psychiatric problems, such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol use disorders. But they will also induce psychological problems that may look like psychiatric problems, but they are not. For example, people may be extremely scared, but it may be realistic fear, like they may be afraid uh, how they will handle their future because they have lost their income. Uh, the, the basis of most international work on mental health and psychosocial support in emergency settings is the Interagency Standing Committee Guidelines, which enables coordination and identifies useful practices and flags harmful practices. It also gives definition of mental health and psychosocial support, a very inclusive definition, which covers protecting or promoting psychosocial well-being and preventing and treating mental disorders. The most well-known slide under the IAC guidelines, most well-known well image is this image, which shows that different services that need to be made available are complementary to each other. We did, we did a, a search to find out what people are actually doing, which we published in The Lancet in 2011, and we found that uh, basic counseling it's the most common intervention that's offered in emergency settings, uh, facilitating support for vulnerable individuals, let's say the social work type of interventions for the second most common, child-friendly spaces, number three, supporting community-initiated supports, number four, and, group, and groups and families counseling. Now, before we get into DRR, disaster risk reduction, just a quick outline what the Sphere Handbook suggests of what should be done in an emergency for mental health in the health sector. And this is identifying, assessing needs and resources, uh, enabling community members, including marginalized people, to strengthen community self-help and social support. The third one is a psychological first aid, making sure that people can provide that to other people who are in acute distress. Number four is the care of people with severe mental uh, health problems, mental disorders. Uh, it suggests that every health service should at least have one staff member that can provide uh, care for, 
for these poems. And then the fifth point is often forgotten. It's the safety, basic needs and rights of people with mental health problems in institutions. Let me just bring this to reality. We've seen disasters in recent years in, in, uh, in Japan, in, in America, in New Orleans, in, in different places. And, we see, uh, and we've seen it in poor countries and rich countries. And many of these places, people, institutions, have uh, not gotten enough attention, have been hurt in, in crisis, unnecessarily so, because they were ignored and forgotten. And the last point that uh, is in the Sphere Handbook is to use disaster for building back better, which is also a key term in DRR, disaster risk reduction. So disaster risk reduction uh, is, is uh, uh, it's a complex concept, but key, key elements of it are, are prevention and preparedness. Here are two documents that are really relevant to, to disaster risk reduction and, and the topic of this speech, which is the guidance note on disability and emergency risk management for health, which was uh, WHO, UNICEF, and also UNISDR is part of this document, and a specific note on mental health and psychosocial support from a uh, from a disaster, disaster risk management perspective, also with WHO and UNISDR. Now I would like to cover some of the main challenges of including mental health and psychosocial support in disaster risk reduction. First of all, as a mental health person, I have to look at my own field and say that the term mental health causes a lot of confusion. That's because we as a field use this term in different ways and uh, this, this causes confusion. So mental health is used when we talk about, this, about addressing mental disability. Mental health is used also when we talk about improving psychological resilience and well-being. And even some of us use the term mental health when we t talk about improving social well-being. Now all these meanings are important, but they involve different actions. And it's a lot to ask of the emergency, uh, of the DRR respond, uh, colleagues to, to understand the finer points of how we use these terms. It's not surprising then that because uh, that mental health is not sufficiently on development agenda, there's, there's many reasons for that, but one of the key reasons is, includes our own use of language and our own conceptual complexities that the mental health field has. Um, stigma is an important reason. We, we know stigma is something that uh, makes it more difficult for including mental health on the development agenda. We know that many countries have, have invested uh, little in mental health so far, and as a result there's low existing baseline capacities. Moreover, when there are capacities, there's often a separation between what's done in the mental health system and in the emergency system. So that, the, that, there is, uh, that there's not enough synergies between the two in terms of developing mental health support that can be useful in emergencies. Now, what needs to be done? First of all, mental health needs to, needs to be given political priority, without a doubt. Uh, this is slowly coming on more and more over the years, but still much more needs to be done. Uh, we also need to, uh, we, we cheerlead our disability colleagues who, uh, who, are, are power, who are a strong community doing a lot of good things, but we wish they would give more attention also to mental disability. And the, we, in terms of preparedness, we think uh, there's a number of things that need to be done. Uh, decision makers, let's say mayors, people who are mayors or district leaders who are responsible for uh, emergency responses, they need to know what to do for mental health. Be they need to know it before there is an emergency. So we need, to, we need to orient our decision makers in what to do. And that includes some very basic general things that decision makers have an influence on, like informing the population what what's going on during a disaster. Making sure that if there is displacement, keeping people together. Uh, looking after, checking how people are doing in institutions. Another thing to be done for disaster preparedness is uh, to make sure that 
uh, when when uh, capacity mapping is done, which is often done as part of development, that it, an emergency preparedness element is included. And during disasters, we know that capacity mapping is really important to see what services are still functioning, which ones are not, what are the resources in the community after the disaster. But before the disaster, we can build capacity for these assessments to, <coughs> to be done well. Similarly, for psychological first aid, which is a very basic intervention, can be learned in half a day, can be offered by teachers, by health staff, by any key person in the community. Now, we don't think it's realistic to train everybody up in psychological first aid uh, at any given time, just waiting for maybe one day a disaster will strike. But we could have, at a, we could have, have training teams that are ready to train others on psychological first aid. So that could be part of this. In terms of indicators, um, uh, well, mental health needs to be part of DR policy without a doubt. But not only does mental health need to be named and included, in addition, we need to make sure that uh, the whole DNR work, uh, world moves a bit, uh, the, it's more inclusive of the software. Right now it's very hardware focused. Um, making sure there's helicopters, making sure water and sanitation is done well. But these people-centered approaches need to take a bigger place in DRR, and that will also make it easier for including mental health. Now, in terms of the indicators at the national, sub-national levels, level, we want to make sure that decision makers are trained in what key actions to do for mental health and psychosocial support. We need to create capacity so people can map capacities during emergencies. We need to create the capacity so people can orient psychological first aid where it's needed in emergencies. Uh, now, a, a big concept in, in uh, disaster risk reduction is building back better. We believe that in mental health uh, has very good examples of building back better. We published a book last year on this with, with uh, cases from these 10 uh, settings and this is something probably where other areas can actually uh, learn from us. So building back better is, a, is, uh, is possible in mental health because the interest in mental health is usually not that high except after an emergency. Let me conclude now first of all to thank uh, the inviters for letting me speak and, uh, and just giving a few key messages. First of all, mental health and psychosocial needs after disaster and conflict are very high. These needs are often ignored. Uh, clear guidelines and technical instruments are available. The response can be largely delivered by non-specialist workers. Emergencies are an opportunity for mental health system re reform. And on a more personal note, I would say, if you do this work, if you work in emergencies or are about to work in emergencies, do take care of yourself. You need to model to others that mental health is important. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mark van Omeren is a key person in this area of mental health and psychosocial support in emergency setting, and he was the first co-chair of the interagency studying committee, ISC, uh, reference group on mental health and psychosocial support in emergency setting. Thank you very much, Mark. And now I would like to invite Professor Harry Minas. Um, Professor Harry Minas is the director of the Center for International Mental Health at the University of Melbourne, and uh, he is a co-director at the WHO Collaborating Center on Research and Training. Uh, Professor Harry Minas works on issues on mental health system development, culture, and mental health, and he's the leading expert in this area for decades. Thank you very much for joining, and the floor is yours. How do I turn this on? It's okay? Yeah. Thank you very much, Takashi, and uh, Madam Ito, thank you very much. Um, it, I was delighted to have the opportunity to participate in this discussion and I am particularly delighted to hear the presentations from the permanent representative from Argentina, 
and also on behalf of the permanent representative from Bangladesh with such strong messages around the importance of mental health in the forthcoming discussions that will occur about the final shape of the post-2015 uh, agenda. We've heard um, a good deal about uh, the many problems that exist in mental health, particularly in developing countries, but also the important message that, that this is not only in developing countries. There are many parts of develop, uh, developed countries where there are very vulnerable populations. Uh, they might be based on ethnicity, they might be based on region, rural-urban divide, and many other factors. So that the, the, the intent that the Sustainable Development Goals are for the whole of the world, not only for the developing world, I think is a critical um, advance in our thinking about these issues. We're here to discuss uh, mental health, uh, mental disorders, mental health and disability, which we know are very closely related and the relationship goes both ways. People with mental disorders are so, um, uh, experience disabilities very often and often very severe disabilities, but also people with other forms of disability, particularly when they experience exclusion, discrimination and the many other difficulties, can also develop mental health issues and so that it's a two-way relationship. Can we have the next slide? On the question of disabilities, I think this is becoming increasingly well known that among the top five uh, broad grouping, health groupings that are associated with disability, mental and substance use disorders have by far the largest, uh, what's referred to as years lived with disability. Um, if you can, that's the red bar on this chart. If you look at the blue bar, which is premature death or years of life lost, it's worth remembering that although it seems very low for mental disorders, this is probably a very significant underestimate because people from mental disorders die from suicide, which is often recorded as accidental or other forms of death or injury. And people with mental disorders, the point was already be, been made by Dr. Tsutsumi, live 15 to 20 years. Those with severe mental disorders you've live 15 to 20 years less than the general population. But they die from usually non-communicable disorders, usually because these are poorly recognised, poorly diagnosed and poorly treated if the person also has a primary mental disorder. So on the death certificate it says died from a stroke or died from the renal complications of diabetes or died from some other NCD, whereas the primary problem um, is mental disorder. So this is a very significant underestimate of uh, premature death among people uh, with severe mental disorders. Next slide. Why invest in mental health and disability? I think it's becoming a lot clearer now uh, that the cost of continuing to neglect mental health and mental disorders is very real. The, the estimate from the World Economic Forum recently is that uh, over the t uh, 20 years between 2010 and 2030, the cost associated with uh, NCDs is roughly $47 trillion. Of that, about a third is attributed to mental disorders. Most of the cost which is attributed to mental disorders is due to the fact of disability. It's due to continuing medical and social care, but also the lost productivity, which is associated with continuing disability, exclusion from access to productive work, exclusion from educational opportunities, exclusion from safe and affordable housing, leading to very low participation um, in society. So we might reasonably expect that reducing premature mortality and disability that's associated with mental disorders by a third would result in a very substantial financial saving over, the, over a 20-year period. And $5 trillion is not, uh, not a small amount of money. Um, we, we are very clear about the relationship between mental disorders and disability, but there are also very clear relationships with non-communicable disorders and also with poverty. And I think a fair bit has already been said about the need for uh, interdisciplinary thinking and intersectoral action 
WHO has been very active. There is now a WHO Mental Health Action Plan, which Mark Van Omeren mentioned and also Aturo mentioned. There is a WHO NCDs Action Plan. There is a, a, an Action Plan on Disability from WHO. But these have been developed essentially with the relevant communities participating in their development and there has been, there is a lot of room for closer integration of these different approaches. We are now uh, almost at the end of the process of developing the Sustainable Development Goals. The presence or absence of a clear mental health sustainable goal will make a big difference in the capacity to integrate. Next slide, please. So what we need to do is to bring all of these different areas of action together, and that can only be done with appropriate and effective governance arrangements. We've spoken about mental health law. CRPD is going to be absolutely critical, but also the development of clearer leadership in ministries um, in individual countries and other forms of effective governance. Investment has to increase very substantially if we're going to make a real difference in terms of mental health and disability. There is a need to foster and support leadership at all levels and across all sectors in the, the, this more integrated way of thinking, appreciating that people with NCDs are more likely to develop mental health problems. People with mental health problems are more likely to develop non-communicable disorders and disability. People with disability are more likely to be excluded and so are people with... So we're dealing with a complex system, a, a system of interrelationships, no one-way causality, reciprocal causality, and, and unless we can bring all this together, then we're going to continue to operate in silos in the way that uh, the MDGs have been criticised for, I think, with some, uh, with some justice. And if we're going to be clear that the SDGs are going to operate in a very different way, which is to bring together all of the different areas in coherent pro programs of work, then I think a mental health target um, as part of the NT NDGs is the kind of critical link that can bring all of these different components together. Next slide. I wanted to illustrate, um, we've, as I mentioned before, we've heard a lot about the problems. I, I wanted to say just a few words about the opportunities that are opening up. And just to illustrate this with a couple of recent developments from the Asia Pacific region, which is the area where I mostly work. Just this month, um, APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, um, adopted the Asia Pacific 2020 strategy and as part of that adopted the APEC roadmap to promote mental wellness in a healthy Asia Pacific. This is a particularly significant step because APEC is not a health, it's an economic forum. And the realization of the fact that health broadly, non-communicable disorders in particular, but also that mental health constitute a significant break on economic and social development is, I think, what has got an organisation like OPEC to say that health capital is as important as any other form of capital if we're going to be talking about poverty reduction, social development and all of those other issues. So this is a quote from the preamble, recognising that health is central to development, that it is a prerequisite for an outcome of and an effective indicator of sustainable development that health and health equity are integral to public policies of all sectors, that the value of health capital in an economy dwarfs any other form of capital. This is a very important statement, I think, for the continuing discussion about the place of health broadly and mental health in particular and disabilities as part of the sustainable development program. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, that's okay. I wanted also to mention a few developments in Vietnam where, where I work a good deal because they illustrate, I think, how rapidly things are moving in terms of national governments realising the development and social implications of health and mental health in particular. So in Vietnam, uh, there's a national mental health strategy which is currently being developed that will be completed by early 2015. 
A national strategy for prevention and control of NCDs will be adopted probably very early in the new year. Um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was ratified last Friday on the 28th of November by the National Assembly. Um, there, there is a commitment to improve health information systems. There are national surveys being done and the, and the possibility of doing annual estimates of burden of disease. So just in the past year or two, there has been remarkable development in a country in which mental health has been relatively neglected in recent times. Next slide. So the message for, for us uh, who are working in the Asia-Pacific is that the Asia-Pacific the Asia region is ready to act on a sustainable development goal, a sustainable SDG mental health target. Um, regional organisations, I've mentioned APEC, but also the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN community will be formed by next year. National governments and sub-national governments I think are all ready to, to move on mental health. And a clear mental health target would focus, expand and accelerate the sort of action which is already being taken. Next slide. The Open Working Group um, has a provisional target 3.4 by 2030, reduce by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases through prevention and treatment and promote mental health and wellbeing. Um, I think there are a couple of things that are missing from this current target and the most important thing that's missing is mention of disability. So reducing premature death is absolutely necessary but it's insufficient. We need also to focus on reducing disability burden uh, by probably the same amount. So I would think that one opportunity is to say, well, could, can this provisional target be rewritten so that it becomes more inclusive for mental health and also of disability. Next slide. The, the Fundamental SDG is a, is a group which has been formed to advocate for um, the inclusion of a clear mental health target in the SDGs and this is the target that has been suggested, the provision of mental health and physical health and social care services for people with mental disorders in parity with resources for services addressing physical health. And there are two indicators that have also been suggested. Next slide, please. This target has been uh, adopted by the uh, UK All-Party Parliamentary Group on Mental Health as Recommendation 4 in a report that was published just this, earlier this month. Next slide. Um, the lesson from the MDGs, I think, is that having a clear target um, increases political attention and commitment. It provides a clear focus on measuring and achieving a target. It increases investment from all sources. It enables a more coherent program of work to be developed and is a focus for collaborative action, as has been discussed, across sectors and across disciplines. And I think what a target can do is bring all of the many disparate things that are current happening and focus those in a way that, that will be most helpful in relation to mental health and disability. So two possible mental health targets, the one that has been proposed by fund Fundamental uh, SDG and also possibly a, a rewritten, revised current target 3.4. Next slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Comprehensive presentation. Oh, thank you very much for the presentation, <laughs> Professor Minas, for your comprehensive presentation. Um, sorry that we are really behind the schedule, and we only have 10 minutes that we can, you know, uh, extend. And we have three speakers, so sorry to put you in difficult situations. But without further ado, I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Rola Wupans. Uh, Ms. Wupans is a human rights lawyer from Justice Canada and she has a background in disability and international development. And she currently works as advocate at the Human Rights Law Section in the Department of Justice Canada. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ms. Ito, distinguished panelists. I'm pleased to be with you today to discuss the important issue of inclusion of persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities in development. I'll try to keep it Quick and short, I'll note that uh, these views are my own and don't necessarily represent those of Justice Canada. 
As we know, there's a distinct relationship between disability and development, with disability and poverty being mutually reinforcing conditions. People with disabilities and those with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities in particular have fewer opportunities for full participation in the economic and social life of their communities. Stigmatization of persons with disabilities often results in discrimination. Many persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities do not enjoy full civil and political rights, such as the right to vote or to exercise legal capacity, or economic, social, and cultural rights, such as opportunities for suitable education and employment. At the same time, the inequalities and precarious living conditions that tend to characterize poverty increase an individual's likelihood of experiencing disability, such that 80% of persons with disabilities live in developing countries. Addressing the needs of persons with disabilities therefore has special importance within the context of development work, as is recognized in Article 30, uh, 32 of the CRPD, and has particular relevance to the effective implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. This is especially so for persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities who are often neglected in development discourse. That being said, the relationship between poverty and disability is not easily changed through the development process. Instead, a strategic approach to inclusive development is essential. Given their significance to overcoming the poverty disability cycle, I'll focus my remarks today on inclusive education and vocational training and on measures to protect and promote the rights of persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities in the workplace. Target 4.5 of, of the proposed SDGs calls for equal access to all levels of education and vocational training for the vulnerable, including persons with disabilities. CRPD Article 24 makes clear that to realize the right of persons with disabilities to education, quality inclusive education must be made available on an equal basis with others and reasonable accommodations must be provided consistent with the goal of full inclusion. Through inclusive education and vocational training, students with intellectual and so psychosocial disabilities can gain skills, increased income and earning potential, confidence, independence and an expanded social network. In this way, inclusive education and training may also have a positive impact on mental health. Importantly, peers, instructors, and others in the community also benefit from inclusion and the opportunity to learn from the individual strengths and perspectives that students with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities possess. Mental health promotion activities, such as programs addressing mental health literacy, bullying, personal safety, and life skills, and healthy relationships, should also be made available in mainstream education settings. To ensure equal access to educational and vocational training uh, opportunities, tailored advocacy efforts are often needed to overcome social barriers that may pose a challenge to inclusion of persons with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities in mainstream programming. A common shortcoming of inclusive vocational training is that skills are often taught that aren't responsive to the labor market. It's important to ensure that persons with disabilities are given access to training for which there's an actual demand in the marketplace rather than they're being considered suitable for only, only for certain tasks. I'll give you an example that I'm familiar with, public inclusive vocational training centers in Iraq. With the help of an ILO UNDP community-based rehabilitation project, public vocational training centers throughout Iraq started to include persons with disabilities in 1998 through their training programs. Initial resistance to inclusion among instructors and family members was one of the most significant challenges faced at the outset. Those challenges were overcome with months of advocacy efforts during which administrators and trainers were introduced to DPOs and successful entrepreneurs with disabilities in the community and by conducting an initial trial period of inclusion and providing concrete examples of accommodation. Newspaper and television media campaigns were also used to raise public awareness about the capabilities of people with disabilities and to inform people with disabilities about opportunities for inclusive training. During the first four years of operation, 800 people with disabilities benefited from the newly inclusive centres. Although most inclusive centres and 90% of private sector businesses that had employed persons with disabilities had closed as a result of the conflict in Iraq, Public vocational training centers continued to develop new curriculum tailored to evolving market needs, and in 2009, the government began to open dozens of additional centers. Despite the difficult challenges now posed by the current circumstances of Iraq, the successful operation of the mainstream public training centers during times when they were able to be more active provides an important example. A key to success of these training centers was that leading employers, employers were involved at the outset in tailoring courses to meet labour market demands 
and arranging traineeships to increase opportunities for successful transition to employment. Though the pro through the process of inclusion, training centers and equipment were upgraded, the curriculum was improved, and connections with em prospective employers were developed. These changes enhanced the training for everyone involved, and inclu including both those with and without disabilities. From education and training, we moved to income earning opportunities, one of the key factors in ensuring that people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities benefit from development. Article 27 of the CRPD protects the right of persons with disabilities to work on an equal basis with others, and target 8.5 of the proposed SDGs calls for full and productive employment and decent work for all, including persons with disabilities. The proposed SDGs also highlight in target 10.3 that equal opportunities must be ensured, including by promoting appropriate legislation, policies, and action. Strategies to protect the rights of persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities in the workplace should include anti-discrimination laws and policies that make it illegal to make decisions about a person's employment on the basis of their disability and to govern workplace behavior. At a practical level, what does this look like? Anti-discrimination policies should set out a commitment to creating and mainstreaming respect for human rights and fostering equality and inclusion, include intellectual and psychosocial disabilities as protected grounds, Define key concepts relating to discrimination that make clear that discrimination can occur in many forms and that it can be subtle and systemic. State that everyone in the workplace has a responsibility to uphold the policy and that managers have an obligation to stop and prevent discrimination. Accommodation laws and policies should be made available to ensure that workplaces are inclusive. In some situations, people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities may seek accommodation to ensure equal opportunities to attain the same level of performance or to enjoy the same level of benefits and privileges as others. Accommodation policies should be governed by principles of dignity, individualization, inclusion, and full participation. They should indicate that employers and employees have a responsibility to work cooperatively to arrive at potential accommodation solutions, require appropriate accommodation unless the employer is able to prove that accommodation would impose an undue hardship, provide for a monitoring mechanism, explain the rights of employees to seek remedies, and include a process of periodic assessment of the policy to ensure ongoing compliance with evolving human rights laws. As we're hearing this afternoon, there are many principles and actions guided by the CRPD and developed from best practices that, if incorporated into development strategies, could benefit people with disabilities and improve development outcomes overall. Still, in order to fulfill rights protected under the CRPD, effectively work toward poverty alleviation, and achieve better development outcomes, equal access to quality education, training, and income generating opportunities for people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities should be supported by development stakeholders, and measures to ensure inclusion uh, in these areas should be incorporated in efforts to implement the post-2015 development agenda. The social and economic returns of including people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities through development processes are high, and I look forward to continuing this discussion with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, and thank you for, for your cooperation to make it really quick. And uh, I really appreciate your setting, you know, uh, important uh, foundation on the legal aspects of this important issue. And now I'd like to have two respondents to respond to all of these pre presentations. Uh, first responder is Dr. Kamal Ramichane. Uh, Dr. Ramichane is a researcher at the Research Institute of Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, in Tokyo. And Dr. Kamal's uh, interdisciplinary research focuses on identifying and remedi remediating social and economic barriers for persons with disabilities. Dr. Kamal. Thank you very much. I know that you have, and we have very limited time, so I don't present a lot of uh, statistics today because basically when I talk, I basically gives you a lot of statistics. But while having said this, I will not definitely disappoint you in the sense, like uh, Laura said, a lot of things about disability, poverty, and the social and the economic returns, and also Professor Harry discussed slightly the need of investment in disability, these actually are very crucial issues which I think we can't now discuss here more. So, uh, but having said this, while talking about disability and mental health or mental well-being, 
these three are very important. But, you know, when disability recently got some space in development efforts, so even within disability, there are several types and the severity. So uh, the possibility is that mental, uh, people with mental difficulties or intellectual disabilities or, or other severe disabilities sometimes are left behind, even within disability. Uh, it's not because they are ignored, uh, but, but because they are not uh, given the priority equally. So our unintentional factors also sometimes act as a negative uh, consequences. So we need to think more uh, clearly on this topic. So it is very timely that this issue, mental well-being and mental health, and in relation to disaster risk reduction, is raised in this uh, discussion. And I was also a part of uh, the EZM last time, last week held in Tokyo, which uh, brought some uh, recommendations that has to be actually incorporated if we really want inclusion, not as a word, but as an implementation, a in the stage of implementation. So within the disability, if we properly invest on them, and if we properly address their individual needs, I, I can give you several empirical evidences that they can be equally productive in the labor market. So Laura told about social or economic returns. I have several papers that examine the returns to the investment in education. The findings are very encouraging, which we can't discuss more here, but I would kindly invite you tomorrow at 3 p.m. in conference room E, in which we will launch a book that focuses on disability, education, and employment in developing countries from charity to investment, published by Cambridge University Press and written by myself, which focuses on several empirical evidences on, uh, for example, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Philippines, and other developing countries. Uh, for now, I think I should uh, limit my words, but last, but, but not the least, it is equally important that we equally give priority to people with severe disabilities, that includes mental or intellectual disability, who have no problems by their disability more, but more problems because of, because of we not properly understanding their individual needs and because of we creating several disabling barriers. If we reduce those barriers, they would be definitely productive, but for that, we don't need to expect everything from like similar done by everyone, but there is a diversity. So if we put the right person to the right job, they would be productive and they would be they would achieve social well-being, economic well-being, or let's say here, they, was, they should be here, uh, be also mentally, mentally well sound in terms of working and in terms of enjoying social inclusion and economic empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rami Chane. And uh, what time is uh, tomorrow's session in conference for me? Uh, it's 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Yeah, thank you very much. Then, last but not least, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Catherine Getsky, uh, who is the President and CEO of Innovative Analysis uh, Incorporated, and she is also the founder of IFRED, which is dedicated to encouraging research on depression and reducing the stigma associated with disease, with the disease depression. Ms. Catherine has also served on advisory boards for the United Way the Breast Cancer Resource Guide, and a local f food bank. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me here. Is my microphone up? Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you very much for letting me speak today. I'm really grateful and honored to be here today. Um, I want to commend the United Nations on your success with the Millennium Goals, especially in regards to inclusion of AIDS. Um, I think it did a lot for stigma reduction and AIDS, and I am thankful um, to date for the work on the post-2015 development goals. Um, you have a large mission and you have an opportunity to expand on a great vision for the world. Um, so I'm here today on behalf of myself, my foundation, IFRED Fundamental SDG, which is a group of multi global mental health experts. 
um, and ask that you strengthen mental health, mental health language in the development goals and add specific indicators to measure progress. So a lot of speakers today gave the why for doing that. Um, the, there's adequate research for including mental health. Um, the $16 trillion projected cost to the economy for not doing so. I think the human, crisis, or the human rights crisis alone must initiate serious and immediate action. Um, so I was gonna take a little bit more personal approach, albeit it'll be abbreviated, um, um, to tell you my story and why I'm involved in this and passionate about it. So I, my dad was my greatest mentor um, in life. He was energetic, brilliant, super committed to our family. Um, we had great holidays together. Um, he made a very impressive life for himself. He finished his master's degree, became a vice president at the First National Bank of Chicago. He provided us great experiences. We got to raft down the river with Sam Walton every year, um, learn from that retail uh, master. He, my dad even insured one, one of those float trips that I got to canoe with Jim Walton. Um, and Jim built a little fire for me in a rainstorm. It was a priceless experience. So as maybe you can imagine, um, it was a devastation for me when I was at college, I was calling home and I heard an unrecognizable voice on the other end. It was a policeman uh, and my father had taken his life. So at that moment, I lost my greatest hero. Um, he was a person I admired, counted on and loved more than anything in the world. And I wish I could tell you that my story of depression and suicide ended there, even you know, tragic though it is. But unfortunately, as it is no surprise genetically, I struggled with depression and I spent years escaping with alcohol, smoking and other addictions, which as you may know are, are societal burdens of untreated and the consequence of untreated depression. So even in my 20s after losing my father and never wanting anyone else to experience that pain, I attempted to take, to take my own life. Um, and I really believe it's a miracle that I'm here today. And that shocking wake-up call got me to treatment. Um, I went on to get an international master's in business. I worked for great companies. I've created my own brand. I have a product line in Lowe's. We've sold over five million. Um, and I, I'm a living example of how getting treatment for mental health can, can have a positive impact on the economy. Uh, I started my own foundation to work to eradicate the stigma of depress depression. We use celebrity engagement. We use the sunflower as the international symbol for hope. And we write a curriculum for 10-year-olds based on research that hope is a teachable skill. So um, I thought a mental health advocacy is my way of giving back to something that really has taken a lot from my life. And it is an understatement when I say that I have been blessed um, by my own access to mental health care. So unfortunately, most people don't have access, the primary reason due to stigma. There are 400 million around the world that have depression, yet less than 50% are re receiving treatment, and that goes up to 85 to 90% in many countries. And the, the reality is we have proven cost-effective treatments for depression. We lose a million people to, to suicide, you know, as they said, more than war and homicides. And we now in the U.S. have one in nine kids self-reporting suicide attempts prior to graduating high school. Um, I believe the stigma is the reason my dad isn't here today and why it took me so long to get treatment. And stigma is really lack of understanding, negative perception, poor branding. And I think the um, development goals are the place to start with stigma. Um, we really need leadership from the top saying that it's okay to get mental health treatment and not just okay, but we, we, we strongly support it. So I stand today in solidarity with depression survivors, those impacted by the loss of someone they love to suicide, and others needing mental health support, including those impacted by autism, Asperger's, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and PTSD. I'm here to say that modifying the sustainable development goals with a strong target and specific indicators is the single most important thing we can do to end stigma and ultimately provide access to care. It sends a clear message to the world from the top, the United Nations, that there is no shame in asking for help and that the world leaders believe in treatment, equality, and human dignity for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for sharing your personal experience and really strong message for the international community. 
and I really apologize for uh, bad time management, but uh, uh, I think we can have a few questions, a really quick question. Um, so one or two, if you have any questions, could you raise your hand and identify yourself? Um, do you have any questions? Maybe not for now, I guess, please. Good afternoon, my name is Liva Saba, I work for UNICEF. I'm working in the disability section. I've heard many times the link made between disability, mental health, um, mental health, developmental uh, impairment, and so on. Um, I've heard how you are connecting, how we are connecting everything in the human rights agenda to um, ensure the rights of all people with mental health, mental impairment, and so on. I also wanted to see in whatever guidance that you have developed, like I just heard the example from Catherine for 10 years old, I mean, from a UNICEF perspective, this interests us, whatever guidance you have prepared, um, I wanted to hear if you've also been thinking about accessible formats for children, for grown-ups who are blind, who have an intellectual disability and may need an easy read for, uh, format because I'm convinced that children with disabilities, physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, also face a higher risk of mental health issues and they need to know where the hope is and what to do to build up that hope. So therefore we need to ensure that if we provide, if we provide guidance, that we make it accessible, that we don't exclude them for that guidance. I don't know if any one of you has an example of that. Thank you very much for your intervention. And UNICEF has been really a kind of leader in uh, integrating mental well-being and also psychosocial aspects into their program, especially in protection and also disability into, you know, your work. So thank you very much. Um, I think now, oh, okay, yes, please. Last week, I think it was in the newspaper or I saw it on Facebook, there was a, a situation where someone who was bipolar, I guess, was screaming at a coworker and then tried to say that, you know, this had to do with his mental health and was seeking an excuse. I'm just wondering, you know, when I'm dealing with employers, many times this is what they're afraid of. They're afraid of not just the person's own behavior and dealing with any legal consequences um, from the person's behavior, but the, be the co legal consequences of the, uh, another employee who may be bear the brunt of the person with the mental health disability. especially in the United States, is, is in the very litigious country, is dealing with the, the litigation at companies. Thank you very much for sharing um, that you know, issue. And I think it is really important point that even in developed countries like the US or Japan or anywhere, uh, there are many gaps existing in mental disabilities and intellectual disabilities, mental well-being. So uh, we hope we can you know, continue working on those issues, both in developed countries and developing countries, I mean, regarding everybody. So uh, due to that time limitation, I have to close. And I think we had a lot of uh, gaps existing uh, in mental disability or intellectual disabilities and promotion of mental well-being in the world. But at the same time, we had a lot of encouraging um, things like the member states are kind of you know, promoting mental well-being into the post-2015 development agenda together with NGOs and civil society organizations. And also uh, we heard there are many tools and knowledge and experiences available to promote <coughs> mental well-being and to protect rights of persons with mental or intellectual disabilities. So I hope um, we can get together again and to continue our efforts together uh, to, to realize mental well-being on the ground and also uh, the dignity of persons with mental or intellectual disabilities. Thank you very much for getting together today and thank you very much for the uh, participants and presenters. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Akiko-san. Uh, just, uh, just, just for information, um, 
please, if you have, uh, again, you know, any contribution or if you have any feedback to this panel, please send it to enable at un.org. We have also uh, requested for information um, or your contact information, so you are already a part of this informal network on mental well-being and disability. So I hope that you would enjoy reading our uh, Enable newsletter as well as specific information on this issue. Uh, in, in very near future. Uh, today is the eve of International Day of Disabled Person, uh, Persons with Disabilities. Uh, and we have, after this, meet, after this panel discussion, we have, we, we have another one on um, enabling our working environment. Uh, tomorrow is the official day, uh, official international day uh, of uh, persons with disabilities, and we have the opening. We have a number of uh, activities, panel discussions on the promotion of technology, disability inclusive disaster risk reduction, and, humanita uh, and humanitarian action, uh, which will take place during lunchtime. Uh, we have also panel discussion on uh, SDG and disability inclusive SDGs, and, and as well as um, the book launch that, um, that was already mentioned. Um, and in the evening, we have UN Enable Film Festival. So we have uh, uh, many um, uh, different activities, and I hope you can join us in all of these activities. Thank you. Thank you very much.